hello and welcome. Uh, today is our first in a series of GSMA Showtime Live events. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you for taking the time and effort out of your busy schedules uh, for joining us here today. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Connor Dempsey. I'm one of the senior directors here at GSMA Services. And my primary role is to ensure our customers, our partners, and operators and members like yourselves are leveraging the full suite of services we have available to help the mobile industry as a whole. We have got a great session here ahead of us, which is focusing on device information in a 5G world. The aim of which is to help you, your team, your company to plan more effectively, reduce costs, increase revenue, and improve your customer experience today in preparation for a 5G world tomorrow. Uh, we've got some great speakers who are going to present to you, and that what they're going to do is talk about how you can achieve this based on the information provided. As a result, we have an action-packed agenda with each session lasting approximately 10 to 15 minutes. The first session is from Pablo, who's from our GSMA intelligence team. Um, Pablo is going to talk about IoT forecasting for 2030. He's also going to talk about the growth of 5G devices and wearables, and also talk about the stimulation within the market for 5G based on falling costs. After which, we have our device information expert, uh, Tyler Smith, who's going to talk about the new device map 5G attributes and explain how operators can improve capacity planning and make adjustments on the fly. The other thing is I'm really excited to say that we have Joseph from one of our partners, Ericsson. Uh, Ericsson is going to talk about how Ericsson are leveraging the GSMA device information to help operators troubleshoot, optimize networks, and solve real life problems. Last but no means least, we have Adrian Dodd, who's the head of our GSMA services team. And Adrian's going to talk about the wider GSMA portfolio, which is ultimately designed to provide real value for our customers, for our partners, and members. At the end, we're going to have a Q&A session where we'll try to address and answer as many questions as possible. Uh, and just to make you aware that this session is recorded and we will be able to share all the content afterwards. Now, your time is valuable. So therefore, this session is about you, and we want to make it as interactive as possible. So therefore, my request to you is to listen to each speaker and each session and give serious thought with regards to how those sessions could help you, your team, your company, uh, use that information effectively, and even potentially make you look like a hero amongst your peers or within your company. So. With that, I'd like to ask lots of questions in the chat on the right hand side, and we'll talk, we'll address them at the end. So, for the next 50 minutes, uh, try and resist the temptation to look at emails, to finish that spreadsheet or that presentation. Do listen, do get involved, do ask questions. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over to Pablo from our GSMA I intelligence team. Pablo, over to you. Thank you, Connor. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Glad to connect with uh, all of you. I'm Pablo Jacobino, Head of Research at GSMA Intelligence. GSMA Intelligence is the research organization within the GSMA. So over the next uh, 10 minutes, we will be looking at uh, the future of devices, uh, some of the important trends shaping the device ecosystem in the 5G era. And then I will be available for questions in the last part of this uh, webinar. So let's get started. Next slide, please. So we do a lot of research on uh, the future of devices, and we see broadly three main trends shaping the device ecosystem in the 5G era. There is a proliferation of uh, connected devices, uh, a growing and diverse range of uh, devices connected to networks uh, for consumer and enterprise use cases. And some of these uh, devices are driving uh, the launch of new services, but also new business models. Then we have a range of new device technologies entering the market and reaching mainstream. We have 5G, 
We have eSIM. We see some early momentum for the integrated SIM, uh, voice over LTE, but also new network requirements in the 5G era, especially around uh, security, identity, and data analytics. Then uh, the customer perspective. What we see is that the customer behavior is changing. The pandemic has accelerated the shift to digital for customers across a range of things, a greater use of digital payments, greater interaction online. Consumers want to be always connected. They want to have multi-device access, multi-subscription, bundling. Last but not least, we see a new trend of a convergence of digital and real worlds with all the discussions around the metaverse. So a lot of new trends. What does it mean for device information? It means that device information is more important, but also complex than ever before. And the other speakers will elaborate more on device information and the benefits that GSMA services provide to all companies looking for a better device information management. Now, we don't have time to go through all these trends, but I want to call out some of the most important. Next slide, please. Let's start with the mobile connections. So we always say that uh, mobile markets have reached uh, um, saturation. The reality is that we still see connection growth. At the end of 2020, there were 8 billion global mobile connections, uh, excluding IoT. We forecast a 20% growth over the next 10 years uh, through to 2030. 20% is a significant growth. It means that there will be 1.6 billion uh, new mobile connections uh, through to 2030. And these new mobile connections uh, will need uh, devices. Some of this growth will come from emerging markets. Uh, some of this will come from uh, developed markets where people want to have multiple devices. The other trend that we see within the mobile connections world uh, is the shift to 5G. So 5G is already mainstream in many countries. At the end of 2021, more than 180 operators had launched 5G commercial services across 72 countries. That is good progress. We forecast that the number of 5G connections will grow significantly over the next years, going from 600 million at the end of 2021 to 5 billion at the end of 2030. 5 billion means 5G will become the leading technology by the end of 2030, accounting for more than half of the total number of mobile connections globally. 5G adoption uh, is going to be different across regions and countries. We forecast that in uh, some of the early movers, for example, US, China, South Korea, Australia, 5G adoption will surpass 4G adoption over the next few years in 2023-2024. Globally, we expect 5G to be bigger than 4G in terms of mobile connections by 2029. So a lot of focus on 5G, a lot of progress. Let's now go deeper on 5G. Next slide, please. When we look at the new smartphones, uh, commercial available, uh, we see that uh, 5G is mainstream uh, in all the uh, smartphone launches, uh, which means that the vendors uh, are really keen to uh, launch 5G devices. Uh, the mix at the moment is 60% uh, of the new smartphone launches have uh, 5G capability, the other 40% have no 5G capability. So 60% is a big number. It means that uh, 5G devices are available to consumers. It's really good progress, as we can see from the, from the chart. My expectation is that in 2022, some of the attention will shift from uh, device availability to prices. Why? Because uh, when we talk to consumers, and we did a survey with the consumers across uh, 10 major markets, uh, consumers say that uh, today the cost of 5G 
is the second largest barrier to 5G adoption. And I'm talking about the cost of 5G devices rather than the cost of a 5G subscription. However, I expect this cost barrier to become less relevant in 2022 because uh, cheaper 5G devices will enter the market. We already see some uh, progress. Uh, the average price of a 5G smartphone is now 500 US dollars and uh, used to be close to 1000 US dollars a couple of years ago. So it's already good improvement, and I expect that the average price of 5G devices will continue to, de to decrease in 2022, which is good news for consumers and good news for 5G customer adoption. Next slide, please. The other trend that we see is that 5G is also bringing higher consumer interest in bundling. When I say bundling, it means bundling 5G connectivity with non-connectivity offerings such as devices, services and content. Our research based on a consumer survey shows that 5G users are more interested than 4G users in adding services and content to their mobile contract subscription. In fact, for example, for video streaming, uh, more than 60% of 5G users say that they will be interested in having video streaming bundled with a mobile package. Uh, the same question for 5G users had the result of uh, uh, 50, less than 50%. So that means that uh, there was a 14 percentage point increase. And this applies not only to video streaming, uh, but across all content, uh, services, uh, and uh, uh, devices. Now, this is an opportunity for operators. Uh, and in order to capture this opportunity, customer segmentation uh, is uh, really, really key, especially for uh, some of the new services, for example, uh, gaming and live sports. Next slide, please. Beyond the mobile phones, we see also a growing and dynamic ecosystem of other devices, tablets, laptops, wearables, smart speakers, smart TVs, plenty of new devices. These devices are very important for operators for a couple of reasons. First of all, operators are a key distribution channel of these devices. In fact, when we look at the split of devices sold by operators, 75% is uh, mobile phones, 25% is non-phones. And when we ask operators, uh, uh, why do you want to sell non-phone devices? What are the strategic reasons? Reducing uh, customer churn is the top factor, but there, there is also a revenue component. Operators uh, expect uh, these non-phone devices to drive uh, service revenue growth uh, and also device revenue growth. And the expectation is that 5G and eSIM will help drive adoption of uh, these non-phone devices. Next slide, please. Last but not least, IoT. IoT is driving an explosion of uh, connections uh, and IoT devices. We forecast that by the end of 2030, there will be 37 billion IoT connections globally, growing threefold uh, compared to 2020. There are many trends happening in the IoT ecosystem. One is that enterprises are driving IoT growth. In fact, we expect that uh, the majority of growth will come from the enterprise IoT use cases in 2022. Within the consumer segment, smart home is driving growth, and the smart watches are now bigger than the fitness tracker market, with healthcare an important driver. Of these 37 billion IoT connections, more than 5 billion will be using cellular IoT connections. And this means that there will be a lot of work to do to connect these devices, manage the data analytics, and manage the device information coming from these devices. Next slide, please. So uh, we have more insights available to you. Feel free to scan these uh, uh, reports, uh, calling out you to some of our latest research on the devices, uh, uh, 5G for consumers, uh, and the IoT market. Next slide, please. 
Just a few words about GSMA Intelligence. We are the research organization within the GSMA. We provide our customers with insights, uh, research, and data across all the trends shaping the device ecosystem. If you are interested in knowing more about GSMA Intelligence, uh, feel free to reach out at info at gsmaintelligence.com or go through our website uh, through this uh, QR code. My final slide. Um, I want to give you an overview of the research teams uh, that we will be driving our focus. Uh, in addition to devices, uh, we will be looking at uh, the change in telco, scaling uh, 5G, <coughs> uh, network technologies, uh, spectrum, uh, uh, the impact of mobile, and uh, so on. And with that, I now have the pleasure to leave the floor to our next speaker, who is uh, Tyler, and I will be av available later on for uh, questions. Thank you. Over to you, Tyler. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, that was very informative. Um, I will also be touching on some of those uh, 5G uh, stats and IoT device information that uh, the GSMA services team has to offer um, to address the growth, the explosive growth um, that you covered over the next 10 years. Um, but again, just to kind of introduce myself, my name is Tyler Smith and I am the senior product manager for all of our device information services. Uh, I just wanna thank everyone who's joined today. Um, my goal today is to give you a, a brief overview of our device information services, and then give more detail and insights, uh, particularly into our newest data attributes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so GSMA device information services is built upon our position as the globally appointed body to administer and allocate TAC to all of the device manufacturers across the world. Um, any OEM that is going to create a device that will have the ability to connect to a mobile network must obtain a TAC, or which is also the first eight digits of an IMEI, from the GSMA or one of our appointed reporting bodies. Uh, when OEMs request a TAC, uh, they're required to provide us with more than 25 device characteristics or attributes, um, however you'd like to classify those, uh, in order for uh, us to review and approve and assign them with a unique TAC code so that they can build out unique IMEIs to implant securely into their devices. Uh, the information that we obtain builds the foundation um, of our device information services from the device manufacturers. To date, we currently hold records of over 206,000 TAC codes, and that includes the details of over 8 billion devices. Um, and you can see we cover the, uh, uh, quite a few different areas, and I will touch on various uh, data points uh, that are included, and particularly the newer ones. Next slide, please. So, we offer several different tiers of our device information services. Um, each of these services build upon the, the other. Um, and the device database seen here in orange is our core service offering. And that includes all of the data obtained during the TAC allocation process. I mean, as I mentioned previously, that contains 25, just over 25 attributes. Um, and device database is really ideal for identifying the core device capabilities, network planning, in-device verification, and simple segmentation of devices in various use cases. Um, our next two service variants are done in partnership um, with our, our partner, Device Atlas. Um, and these services are, are called in Device Map Light, GSMA Device Map Light, and GSMA Device uh, Map. Uh, the Additional data in Device Map Lite contains all the same data as Device Database with the addition of nine data attributes. These additional data attributes uh, have been curated and are ideal for more precise in market device model and marketing names. When you jump up to Device Map, um, there's substantial growth in the service and, and the use cases are endless. Um, device Map is inclusive of the data that we have in device database and the additional data attributes in device map light. And that now contains over 150 data attributes. Um, device map, 
as I mentioned, has lots of different use cases covering many verticals. Um, some of these are more detailed uh, or can include more detailed network planning and analysis, uh, primary hardware identification, endpoint IoT types. Um, I'll cover more on that towards the end of my presentation. Um, further device identity uh, and the creation and ability to create extremely targeted marketing campaigns um, and content delivery. Next slide, please. So now I want to touch on what we've recently done over the past uh, couple of years and then brought to market uh, more recently. Um, I guess a few months back, we recently launched finally into all of our device information services um, to include more details on the performance uh, and the capabilities of devices which indicate that they are supporting a 4G and 5G and carrier aggregation technologies. Uh, in October of uh, 2020, uh, we put in the requirement through the Terminal Steering Group that OEMs would be required moving forward to provide these additional details when they were obtaining TAC. Um, at that same time when we launched that, we also initiated a process uh, for which these device manufacturers uh, who have already allocated devices that supported the bands in those categories, i.e. 4G, LTE, carry aggregation, and even some 5G, um, for them to easily update the historical data as well. Um, so all of this new data points are now available and have been for, for several months um, in all three of our service variants. Uh, the new performance information included is um, the uplink and downlink speeds in, within bands, the MIMO support layers, QAM, uh, and carry aggregation performance as it relates to speeds. And I'll touch on that in more detail. Next slide, please. So now that we've captured all of this new band performance information, how is it helpful or useful to the ecosystem? The largest benefit would be around further network optimization for mobile network operators and mobile virtual network operators and all of those entities that are providing services to those uh, MNOs and MVNOs. All these new data points can help determine uh, things such as timing uh, and addressing when you should sunset or when you're able to sunset 2G and 3G networks or determining if it is now time to invest in 5G for the first time or is it time to begin expanding more 5G coverage. All this new information on the device uh, information that we have helps determine and fine tune the current network capacity and also better understand your current uh, devices on your networks or within your uh, or if you're handling those devices even, the current devices of those, uh, what their abilities are. Uh, for example, what speeds can device X, right, handle? And is there a better way to, say, optimize utilization that device type Y uh, has on my network? You can also use this new information to quickly identify and determine devices that could be causing issues on your network. Um, and Joseph from uh, Erickson will will touch on that in more detail in his his section after this. Next slide, please. So here um, pulled out some very simple examples of what that new data attributes uh, around band performance includes. Um, all of the band performance details that have been added resulted in a very large increase of data and also the complexity in how that data is captured and also rendered. Uh, as a result of this, we decided to move from the previous uh, .csv format to a JSON structure uh, to better and efficiently manage and provide the information to all of our end users. Um, and some of these simple samples, I just wanted to put in a human readable format um, to kind of give you an idea of what we've been talking about as far as the uplink, downlink, et cetera. Uh, so in this first example of the 4G um, performance information, so you've got the LTE FDD band one, um, indicating that the device does support this band. And you can see also that it supports MIMO as a two by two in the downlink. And you move over to the blue shaded cells, you see the QAM that's supported in uplink and downlink. 
Uh, then if we drop down over to the 4G aggregation band, in the second example here, um, you'll see the CA band that supported uh, the sub band. You've got your MIMO information again, and then you have the carrier aggregation uh, modulation schemes and the uplink and downlinks that are supported in those areas. And you can see that in orange, as well as the classes. And then also included just to showcase a, a 5G, which is very similar to the 4G one, um, just to show you that it's a DC band, it's, it's a two band, shows the sub band and all the variations there. Next slide, please. So another area that has been a major focus for our device information services um, really over the past two years is IoT. Um, more and more IoT devices are showing up in the market. And as we saw from Pablo's presentation, that trend is expected to continue and be very explosive over the next 10 years. Uh, this past year, or almost over a year ago now, we rolled out some other attributes for, which are available through our device map service. These are further identification of IoT devices. So rather than just relying on a device type identifier or a primary hardware type, um, you can also look now to see if an IoT device, um, you know, what kind is it? Is it an endpoint, an enabler, or is it a IoT controller? And that, and that provides a lot more um, information to the end user of the data to better determine what the purpose is uh, of the device and that particular IoT device on your network. Um, and with those new information and in conjunction with the other information, um, you know, for example, such thing as, okay, I see this may be a GPS tracker as a primary hardware type, and then you can go look, okay, is this an IoT endpoint, an enabler, or an IoT controller? And that gives you more insight into exactly what and how that particular IoT device model is um, intended to be used. Um, and that just assists in greater accuracy of network traffic and also some priority settings based on what it might be. Um, thank you again. This is my last slide, but I thank you again for your time today. I welcome questions now, later, um, at any time. Happy to have more further discussions. I know I covered a lot of information, um, but please do place any questions you have in the chat. Um, and we'll do our best to get to them now, today, or we'll get back to you offline after this. So it's my pleasure now to hand it over to Joseph from Ericsson so that we can learn how they are utilizing um, GSMA device information services today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Josip. Uh, with me is my colleague Ivan here in presentation and uh, we are glad to be your uh, guest today in this uh, session. Uh, we have been members of the network data analysis uh, team in Ericsson last uh, several years and all this time we are somehow in touch with uh, GSMA of course uh, along with uh, uh, our other platforms and uh, tools and today we want to show you a couple of examples of how and where GSMA help us in our daily work. Uh, we have prepared uh, four examples from four different teams within Ericsson, uh, where the analysis uh, was done uh, using GSMA tables as a third party source. Uh, just to note, in uh, all the examples, uh, GSMA was used as an aggregator and enrichment uh, of the network data with additional information so that the analysis itself uh, would be available for a larger number of uh, users, uh, experts, and uh, for uh, different uh, business needs. Yeah. And the uh, common benefit uh, for us using GSMA uh, is uh, speed uh, in processing data, simplicity, and uh, multiple display dimensions that uh, are present in a GSMA database. So uh, I will move uh, to our first example, first use case. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, first example of uh, GSMA in our wall, uh, daily work uh, is device uh, model breakdown. Uh, 
uh, it's kind of a request from customer to do an analysis and correlation between uh, number of subscribers and data consumption in network in order to create uh, new data uh, bundles for their subscribers. Uh, we applied the GSMA data on uh, terabytes and terabytes of data from network in order to map one or more TAC numbers to various UE attributes uh, from GSMA table like device name, UE type, radio capability, model name and so on. Uh, in that way we got aggregation level of our data and um, human friendly output. Uh, that's important because uh, many people uh, prefer more to see uh, some text like uh, iPhone 7 than eight digits of uh, TAC number. Yeah. Also, it helps us uh, to reduce hardware and uh, optimize performance power uh, on our systems uh, due to aggregation and uh, grouping of uh, data. Uh, on this chart, uh, precisely, you can uh, uh, easily see and read uh, the output, uh, change it according to different uh, attributes, and uh, finally decide which data plan to create and uh, offer it to, to which uh, user. Uh, in this specific case, iPhone 7 and iPhone 8 are most popular uh, uh, smartphones in uh, network, uh, while uh, Mobile routers, I think uh, Huawei here, are generating the most of uh, traffic. Uh, maybe customer needs to check uh, their subscription and offer them something higher. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, uh, 5G UE performance is second example and uh, very hot in early stages of uh, 5G deployment. Um, the, this use case is a bit moved towards customer experience, almost live monitoring of different UEs in a network, and uh, many KPIs uh, from RTT, throughput, uh, packet loss, uh, failures on uh, uh, network nodes, uh, can be compared uh, with similar between similar UEs or groups of uh, UEs. Also, uh, the uh, KPIs can be monitored during uh, the time, which is very useful during some uh, changes like uh, network and uh, UE software uh, upgrades, uh, introduction of uh, new network features, uh, config changes, and uh, so on. On the, this slide, we can see uh, this line. Uh, one such example where uh, run issues at some point, uh, probably after uh, a new run feature was introduced, increased for Samsung uh, S20. Uh, operators now can uh, perform rollback uh, of uh, to old changes until the issue is further troubleshoot troubleshooted and solved, or they can uh, contact uh, UE vendors and try to solve it uh, uh, together. However, uh, this uh, quick reaction uh, live environment can decrease number of uh, complaints and increase user satisfaction and of course uh, prevent uh, churn. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Terminals, type of uh, terminals and uh, usage. Uh, this use case is similar uh, to charts on the uh, first slide, but uh, request uh, was to analyze all terminals in uh, network during the uh, uh, three day period uh, and search for devices ready for uplift and at the same time uh, prevent uh, a churn of uh, subscribers. Yeah. Uh, the key for this analysis was to create good terminal segmentation uh, because you know uh, machine to machine and the smartphone are so different in their behavior in network that they shouldn't be treated uh, uh, the same at all. Uh, for this purpose, uh, the team used uh, GSMA uh, UE categorization 
And uh, basically on left side is breakdown per different uh, terminal uh, groups and average data usage uh, per each uh, terminal group. On the right side, you can see uh, some terminals group, uh, the same terminal groups, but uh, uh, grouped uh, in different uh, data bundles uh, from less than one megabyte to more than 10 uh, gigabytes. And idea uh, was to move the users uh, to higher <laughs> data usage group if they have uh, capable terminals uh, for, for that. Uh, you can see that 90% of uh, terminals are smartphones uh, with uh, 2 gigabytes average consumption, while 6% of uh, USB PCs devices uh, generates uh, um, around uh, 12 gigabytes per user in average. So, uh, but on left side, you can uh, you can also see that 40% uh, of them is uh, up to one gigabyte and 60% uh, uh, more than one gigabyte for uh, smartphones. And uh, actually the, that does 40% uh, of users uh, are ready for uplift. Um, don't know uh, the final recommendation to, to customer uh, in this analysis, but uh, when looking at the, this uh, chart, I would like to, I, I would uh, add one more uh, group let's say from uh, one gigabyte to five gigabyte, because if we look at average for smartphones, it's uh, pretty clear that uh, a lot of user it's closer to one gigabyte than to uh, 10 gigabyte in, in, in that uh, data bundle. So this uh, additional group uh, uh, we can, uh, can make better uh, data bundling for uh, smartphone uh, users. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, last uh, slide, it's, uh, let's say, a breakdown of terminals uh, per year. Uh, this is a, a good chart and because uh, uh, many customers always plan to introduce something new and shut down something old, like introducing uh, 5G and shutting down 3G or 2G. And basically uh, many of them don't know what they are, what they have uh, up and running uh, in network on each technology uh, at the current moment. Yeah. So uh, to answer those questions, uh, we collect data from uh, network and uh, organize all the collected terminals from network per year of release, uh, technology they are using the most time, even uh, how much time they spend on each technology. Uh, you know, uh, on 4G, uh, you can spend more data in one minute than in one hour on 3G <laughs> almost. Uh, on the chart, you can see that the uh, last few years LTE is dominant, but uh, 5G devices uh, uh, are fast growing uh, last two years. Uh, also, uh, uh, we had uh, recently a situation where customer uh, wanted to shut down 2G, but uh, during the analysis we found that there, there are lots of uh, old uh, uh, terminals, uh, smart metering uh, devices on uh, 2G and 2G only capable. Uh, among them were, were sensors for avalanches, uh, sensors on railways, highways, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, basically, uh, very important devices, but uh, somehow forgotten. Yeah? Uh, and customer first uh, needed to replace them with new devices and then continue with uh, 2G uh, shutting down. Yeah. Uh, right side, uh, we can see breakdown per screen resolution and uh, pixel per inch. Uh, this is just to show more different angles of uh, analysis we can uh, do. And especially these measures uh, directly directly affect the consumption of uh, data, especially if you talk about video. Uh, basically, to achieve the same user experience, but uh, for different uh, screen sizes of a smartphone, the amount, amount of bytes spent for one video can be very different. 
you know that uh, many service services like YouTube have mechanism that monitor screen sizes and thus send the user uh, the appropriate uh, video resolution. So uh, basically the higher uh, resolution, the more data needs to be sent from remote uh, server to the terminal. Uh, also, uh, these charts uh, are uh, very often used in uh, marketing uh, to show uh, trending of uh, modi mobile phones uh, regarding the, the, the screen size. And uh, basically we have uh, uh, lots of examples uh, of uh, GSMA in our daily work, but uh, uh, these four are selected and approved uh, to share. And I think uh, quite enough for 15 minutes uh, time slot. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we are open for any questions uh, uh, later. I think uh, Connor will continue now. Over to Brilliant. Connor. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Yasip. Uh, hopefully, everyone found that as intriguing as I do with regards to how uh, operators can plan accordingly, do marketing, optimization. And even drive revenue. So thank you for that, Yosef. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand yeah. over to Adrian Dodd, who's the head of GSMA Services. Adrian, up to you. Thanks very much, Connor. Yeah, particularly fascinating to see how Ericsson is supporting his customers, uh, particularly on the, the ARPU analysis and the, uh, the spread of devices across the, the different generations. Anyway, my name's uh, Adrian Dodd. Um, I look after the, uh, the services at GSMA in, in total. And uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, these sessions always have a theme. This time it was GSMA's device information, but we have a variety of other services. And this is our, our catalog, which I invite you to, to look at offline. Um, so I felt that there were a couple of other services related to device information and some hot topics that would be useful to just draw to your attention on this session. So I'll just uh, take you through a few of those because uh, I think they'd be very useful for your uh, attention. So let's move to the first one on the next slide. And this is uh, called the GSMA Interoperability Testing, which we launched late last year. The, the background to this is that most um, devices are shipped with the IMS Volte stack switched off for networks unless the device manager uh, sorry, the device manufacturer has undergone specific testing uh, with a particular network to make sure interoperability is going to work. And um, the, the problem with this is obviously with the IMS Volte stack um, deactivated, even though you've launched 4G and 5G, you have to revert, revert to 2G and 3G just to make voice calls. And the problem with that is, even though you've launched 4G and 5G, you're unable to switch off 2G and 3G and refarm that spectrum that you desperately need for the, the 4 and 5G expansion. Um, so why does this problem exist? Um, it's basically a volume of testing problem. The, the device manufacturers cannot really uh, afford all the resource and time to test with every single network operator in the world. Equally, the network operators can't do all of the testing with all of the different uh, versions of device on their network. Um, so the GSMA have had a think and um, we've come up with this interoperability testing service to help solve the problem. And fundamentally what it does is it, it creates a standardized set of tests for networks and devices. Um, and if you as a network operator or device manufacturer conduct those tests, um, you will be seen to be at a certain standard, an interoperable standard, and we will issue you with a certificate. And we had a committee of experts design what that standard was. And then the idea is that the network operate, well, we through this service will pass the certificate to the device manufacturers, and the intention is that they open the Volte and IMS stack um, for you. Uh, and this is to help the rollout of, of Volte and IMS on 4G, and make sure it's um, enabled. Um, so using this service, by doing one test, you can hopefully solve a huge amount of um, testing expense um, 
and uh, a lot of time and effort and speed out this rollout of Vaulty. So uh, I think it'd be very interesting for you to have a look at this on gsma.com slash services. And we'd be delighted if you'd like to to engage with us on this because um, it's really going to speed things up. Thank you. So then uh, the next one I wanted to touch on is the GSMA Network Settings Exchange. Now the core and primary purpose of this is to allow operators to upload all of their IMS settings, Vaulty settings into one place once. And then that allows all of the device manufacturers to go to that same place and extract the network operators settings for their devices. Um, so the similar idea about efficiency in the ecosystem is with interoperability testing. Um, and for each device to work properly on each network, they obviously need to have the settings of that, that network in the device. So this is an exchange where operators can put it in once, everybody can draw it down, and we have 500 uh, device manufacturers that you can access as a network operator through this service. And that in, in turn again leads to this interoperability. Um, but one of the other reasons why I wanted to mention this is because if you if you wanted to do the interoperability testing as well, uh, the interoperability testing service can download your network settings from the network settings exchange in order to calibrate and configure the, the test equipment um, when you're doing interoperability testing. So also I invite you to research this one again, gsma.com slash services. Uh, it's pretty good, and as an operator, you can reach 500 of all of the biggest uh, device manufacturers to get your, your settings ingested. Thank you. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, we've also done a lot of work on um, eSIM, and uh, obviously this is starting to pick up the pace. More and more devices are starting to include eSIMs, and more and more operators are starting to, to process eSIMs. Um, one of the challenges with eSIM is that, you know, when a customer buys a brand new device, they switch it on, the eSIM is empty. And the, the purpose of the GSMA eSIM discovery service is that the device, when it activates, first looks to our eSIM discovery service, where it will find a flag from the operator who's just um, done the transaction with the consumer and sold the device and the account. Um, and that flag will point the device to the, the correct operator in whatever country in the world that, that you're in, so that the device and the eSIM can download the profile for the customer who's just activating that device. And the marvellous thing about this is it gives you a completely fully digital experience. Um, the, the device just switches on and the, the process to get the profile just happens automatically without any human intervention. Now, we provide this service through the eSIM provisioning um, um, vendors, of which we have four. So again, if you look on our website, uh, you can see who they are, and I invite you to, to have a look at that because it really improves the device or customer activation process in store or online. Um, finally, um, we're doing a really interesting new program around blockchain and roaming. It's not so related to the devices, but um, in April we're doing a, a free trial um, to allow operators to, to test this. And what it is, is um, blockchain allows secure and accurate business transactions. So we want to set up a, a global blockchain network between operators and we're calling it the e-business network. And the first application is going to be roaming uh, applications. And we found because we were trialing all last year with eight large operators that you can improve the accuracy and the speed of settlement and reduce the number of disputes you get when you're conducting um, roaming settlements at the end of each month. Um, so if you'd like to participate in this free trial, um, We'd be delighted for you to get in touch with us. Um, the purpose is that you test this in parallel with your existing roaming operations using the real data 
so that you can test the benefits uh, that we know are there versus your current system. And um, again, that's quite an interesting one for you to pass on to your roaming, agree uh, roaming um, uh, department. Anyway, with that, I uh, hope that's useful also for you and sort of relates to, to the, the building device ecosystem and, and our attempt to solve some of the complexities uh, that are taking place out there. Um, so with that, I will hand back to Connor, I believe, for the, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Adrian. Uh, very insightful and good to kind of see the wider portfolio uh, with regards to how you and the team are helping operators and such. So uh, what I want to do is take this kind of last seven minutes or so uh, just to ask any questions that people may have. Uh, if you do, you can feel free to put them into the chat. Uh, we did have one which was aimed at Tableau and specifically around 5G and ARPU, uh, which is obviously important to operators. Uh, can you give us a bit more insight, a bit more detail with regards to what drives it, will it drive more revenue uh, and such like Tableau? Sure, Connor. Thanks for the for the question. So what we see is that operators are reporting uh, an ARP uplift when uh, consumers switch from 4G to 5G. And uh, China is a good example. Uh, in China, the operators are reporting a 10% ARPU uplift, which is a good sign for the industry. And the same applies to South Korea. When we ask consumers, hey consumers, uh, are you interested in paying more for uh, 5G if you get uh, some extra content and extra value? The answer is uh, yes, and typically we see that uh, um, consumers are willing to pay uh, up to 10% more for 5G services. Um, with Europe, uh, it's probably 4-5% more. So there is an interest from consumers to pay more if they get extra content and uh, operators are reporting an up, 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 uplift. What drives it is basically faster speeds, um, quality improvement in terms of networks, but also, as I said earlier, bundling of 5G with other services, especially gaming and video. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Pablo. It was, um, and then, Tyler, you were talking about uh, TAC allocation and such like, and it covers over 8 billion devices. Can you give us uh, any indication with regards to how many uh, vendors it covers and then how often the information, TAC information is updated? Uh, yeah, yeah. So as far as vendors and device manufacturers that are participating on average on a year over year basis, as far as you know, who's allocating at least one TAC a year, uh, that's in the about 1500 uh, range of active manufacturers at any time during the year. Um, and then as far as our database services go, our device information services, those are updated. Um, you know, we write the information as soon as we get it from attack allocation to the database. And then that database is updated at minimum on a daily basis um, for data. So if you're downloading the data on a daily basis, you're getting the latest information. Uh, we also have the the system set up to where you can, for uh, particular on device database, you can do a delta uh, setup and device map. All of these are set up so that you can go and automate the download process um, to reduce any human interaction and be able to seamlessly ingest that information into your respective uh, business units. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Tyler. And and then just I'd notice on one of your uh, slides you were talking about how you can track failures of the network core and nodes. Uh, is the able, operator able to see that? Are they able to track the failures uh, with or without you? How does it work? Uh, hi. Uh, yes, uh, actually operator can see those failures uh, and tag digits on uh, their nodes, uh, but uh, uh, usually they monitor only a uh, failure ratio or success ratio of some procedure like uh, attached to network uh, for all the devices in network together uh, where threshold is around one to two percent but uh, recently in our uh, analysis with uh, gsma data loaded uh, we noticed that uh, one group of terminals uh, precisely m2m uh, automotive group uh, with a lot of different uh, 
stack uh, digits, numbers, uh, they generated almost 50% uh, of that 1% failures on uh, MME uh, network node. And uh, basically they did it not notice that uh, for months. And honestly, we know uh, we uh, discovered this by chance uh, because uh, it was not our goal or, or goal of our analysis. Uh, but uh, they needed uh, then several hours to fix that issue, but sometimes uh, they need uh, weeks uh, for troubleshooting of some failures because it's very hard uh, to work uh, with uh, digits, like 80 digits uh, of TAC, and it's not human readable. And uh, uh, basically, it's much, it's much easier uh, when you have uh, GSMA data uh, and GSMA attributes like uh, device model vendor and the marketing name to, to group somehow uh, those devices and then you get a uh, better bre breakdown of failures. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Thank you. For that. Joseph. And a couple of questions just come in now. Uh, just out of curiosity, with regards to Ericsson, which of your applications are the most popular? First question. And then second question is, uh, have you used DPI engine for calculating volume consumption? Per service per application. Uh, basically, uh, first question. Uh, the most popular application uh, are, let's say, for social networking, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, video applications. Uh, YouTube is one of the most popular uh, worldwide, and. Uh, then uh, we have uh, like a local application uh, for each country or region that uh, are very popular. For example, in Scandinavian, uh, they use HBO Nordic. It's very, it's very popular there. Yeah. So they have mm -hmm. almost all uh, installed uh, 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 up on a mobile phone. So uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, the usage of uh, DPA, DPI engine, uh, yeah. We use DPI somehow uh, on transport uh, layer uh, to, to to find uh, uh, to map uh, service uh, providers. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, communication with you, YouTube is encrypted, and uh, we use DPI to discover that it's uh, actually YouTube, uh, Google service YouTube. But uh, later, uh, regarding the terminals, uh, terminals are uh, enriched with the GSMA uh, data yeah. and uh, uh, correlated with uh, TAC uh, digits uh, we got uh, from network. And uh, basically, Actually, you, in our database, yeah. we have pivot table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so do you mind if I just pause it there just for a second? Because conscious a lot of people be dropping off soon. Uh, Firstly, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time and effort and joining us here. Uh, have your busy schedules. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, we're going to have a couple of more of these sessions. We've got one in April, which is talking on Bolti, and we also have another one, which is talking about eSIM. Uh, so, yeah, it'd be great if you can join us. Um, if you want to get in touch with any of us, please do so uh, after the event, and we'll share the recording and the uh, slides as such like. But, yeah, I just want to say thank you before everyone disappears. But for those who are still st staying on, um, Yosef, uh, do you want to continue on that? And we've got a few more questions coming in. So, yeah, mm -hmm. over to you, Yosef. Okay, I see. Uh, which DPI engine, Ericsson or, or other party? I think it's uh, Ericsson and it's uh, simple. Sometimes we search on uh, TCP and sometimes on the UDP. Okay, uh, next uh, question is uh, related to TLS SSL on uh, uh, TCP. Uh, for now, uh, we're using SNI, server name indicator, uh, which is uh, plain text in uh, all that encrypted uh, traffic. Uh, we can use it uh, for identification, but now I think uh, that part, that, that SNI will be encrypted uh, as well. And uh, Ericsson, I think, uh, is developing some uh, uh, some uh, predictive methods uh, for for traffic analysis uh, based uh, just on uh, uh, TCP uh, connection, TCP KPIs, and so on. 
but uh, it will be very difficult to capture uh, to map uh, service providers. Uh, we have only uh, the um, IP layer. Uh, if we search uh, enough uh, IPs and uh, correlate them with a specific uh, service provider or uh, CDNs. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Hey, for anyone else who's still online, do you have any questions specifically you'd like to ask the team? No, anyone for anyone? Um, just one question for me, uh, Tyler and Adrian. You talked about NSX and um, the uptake on it. Like currently, how many users do we have or operators using yeah, NSX? I'll take that, Adrian. Um, so for Network Setting Exchange, currently we have just over 100. Um, and that's between MNOs and MVNOs providing their settings. Um, and then from a device manufacturer perspective, we have um, just over 500 uh, participants. And, and that includes, obviously, the very large and popular ones as well. Brilliant. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, please say. But if not, uh, I'd like to thank you. I uh, hope you found this session of interest. Uh, as we said, we got a, this is the start of a series of uh, webinars and online events we're going to do to try and help you and kind of spread the good word with regards to GSMA services and the solutions we provide to help you. So uh, with that, thanks again. Have a lovely day and uh, hopefully speak soon. Take care all.